we're skipping away from Asia and, and moving to Africa here. And this is the story that until recently, until like Wednesday, fighting was getting worse in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. So this is the news that insurgent groups, primarily the Rwandan-backed M23 rebel group, have been involved in the heaviest fighting in the east of DRC for, for years. Now, the M23 is a rebel group that is alleged to be backed by the Rwandan government. Obviously, the, Rwanda, the Rwandan government denies that. But the, the M23 group is made up of Congolese Tutsis who see themselves more out Rwandan than they do perhaps Congolese. You know, that's very general, obviously. But the, the, the rub of it is that millions of have been displaced in the fighting. It's drawing in players from around the region. It's got Africa's big players, the regional players, really focused on it. The Uganda and Kenya are, are worried about it. So I guess the other development is that they signed a ceasefire two days ago and there's questions about whether it will hold or not. One of the things that jumped out at me about this story, and this is not a region I know particularly well, is that this has a comparatively large deployment of UN troops that have been yeah. there for quite some time. And when I'm talking about large, I think the numbers I saw was something like um, M23 is estimated having 2,000 fighters, give or take, whereas the, the UN force deployment is 12,000. And still it has been ineffectual in preventing this violence from spreading. And I think that really highlights the incredible limits on UN peacekeeping anywhere, historically anywhere, but especially in conflicts that are far from the limelight, where, for those who don't know, when the UN sends troops somewhere, it is in fact troop contributions from individual member states, each of which comes with a document thicker than my arm, that outlines their specific terms of engagement, what they can and can't be used for, what they will and won't do, and ends up creating a force that may look more than sufficient on paper, but in practice finds it hamstrung, paralyzed, and unable to play the role that I think is envisioned for it. And I know that's caused a lot of frustration in the Congo with people saying, well, hold on, why aren't you protecting us? Why are you here? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, the point you made there at the end is why you have to have, I mean, I'm sure there's a, a military doctrine rule of thumb about how many times more troops you need to deal with these kinds of insurgencies. But, you know, you're bringing in troops from Europe, from Asia, from Australia, from everywhere, or wherever the member states have contributed the troops to the UN fighting force. And, and it's probably actually more just regional African forces, but they're still fighting in a place they don't know well. As you said, they're limited by terms of engagement. And just like the lessons we're learning in the, in the Ukraine war, again, it's much harder to keep peace and maintain stability over an area of land than it is to run away into the jungle, come in, blow something up, fight something, and then run away again. So these things are super, super hard to do. And it's why the political element of these are so important. Realistically, until the two governments or all the political leaders of all the factions involved until they decide they don't want to fight anymore, they will be fighting. They just will be because you can say, oh yes, we won't, we'll stop fighting. But until Rwanda agrees to stop backing that group or tells them to stand down until the Congo makes the, the necessarily, I don't want to, I don't want to say appeases Rwanda, but reaches an understanding with Rwanda, the fighting will continue. And thankfully, as I said at the start, when on Wednesday, it looks like there was a ceasefire and it is, I think in the terms of that ceasefire, it is understood that if the rebels take up arms again, then there will be a regional force from Africa that will go in and try and stop them. So I, I mean, I think it's good develop. It's a, it's a great development, but we'll just have to see how long it holds. Before we, before we move off this onto the next topic, there is yeah. a rare earths element to a uh, pardon also the true. awful pun. Jesus, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> John, did you just want to say, say a few words about that? Cause I think it's going to be a defining story of the 21st century. And, you know, and as we, particularly with climate investment and batteries and smartphones and electronics the demand for rare earths is is increasing and it was, will only increase and the, the sad thing is that rare earths have to be dug out of the ground and they're often in places where they're not particularly politically stable so you can really probably expect these kinds of things maybe not in this exact structure but conflict and disagreements around rare earths places where rare earths are um, to increase but i mean it's easy just to put it down to that this is obviously an ethnic a historical kind of thing as well but that's the, the minerals element is also a, a big part of it i believe the mineral is called columbite tantal tantalite and it's effectively only found 
there. And it's one of these, again, it's one of these metals you've never heard of, but which turns out to be pivotal to making certain forms of high-tech electronics. And I think that's going to be an issue that comes up more and more, if we're being honest. Plenty of different places, yeah. So our next topic. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please give us a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel to be notified as soon as we put up new videos. Also, don't forget that down below is a link to the amazing International Intrigue free daily newsletter so that you can be ahead of the news at those water cooler conversations. Thanks so much.